Welcome back for more Bio 20. This is our last chat of the semester. We're going to talk about animals. And here turn out to be the objectives. Again, it's a lot of can you tell them apart? So last time we talked about uh, plant diversity. So we had the avascular plants, which are really small. We then dealt with the seedless plants. These have xylem and phloem, which are the vascular tissues, and they got to be bigger. Then we got the plants that started to make seeds. So we had the naked seeds, which are the gymnosperms. These tend to make cones, and then we have the fleshy seeds, or the angiosperms. These are the ones that make flowers. So when we look at animals, and we have to figure out what are they, it, it's the problem that we've had with a lot of things this semester. It's like, well, how do you define these words? Because we know what they are, but we have to have a definition, because we want to have a definition. And it turns out, um, we're the collagen makers, and we make collagen in order to maintain structures. We're also all exclusively heterotrophs. Sometimes we can act not as heterotrophs, but we're primarily heterotrophs, meaning we have to eat. We have complex tissues that we form, and we can communicate using electrochemical chemical communication. There are some weirdo exceptions to this, like the sponges, and it seems like they actually lost their ability to do this. Basal animals are the ones that don't really have a body plan, and we think it might be because they evolved out of it, but we have things that we call placozoans and sponges. They appear to be more like a loose conglomeration of cells, so there's not as much uh, coordination. So this is a basic sponge body plan where you actually have um, openings and fluid will flow in that flows out the top of it. They actually turn out to be made. They have little skeletal, skeleton parts, and you could actually study a lot about sponges if you felt like it. People ignore them. When we look at sponges in the placozoa that they're these categories right here and it turns out a recent article is pointing out that these other things that i'm throwing over here off to the side that i just highlighted these actually are stranger than what we think the peripherins and the placozoans turn out to be although we do clump them with the cnidarians and it's not for a good reason so some animals have what we call radial symmetry. So these include what we call the cnidarians or the stinging animals. So if you think of sea jellies or corals or, or anemones, they all happen to have these cells called nematocysts, and they all have within their nematocysts these, or you have the thing called the nidocyte, and within the nidocyte is the nematocyst. Helps if I could get the words right. And they have these little triggers that you don't need, they don't need to be alive for them to work. And the barbs that they contain usually have a neurotoxin, so don't touch them. The tenophores, I know there's a C in Cnidarian and tenophore, but you don't pronounce the C. The tenophores are these ones right here, and these are comb jellies. They don't stick, and there's actually a paper that just came, about, came out about their nervous system, and it's unlike any other nervous system on Earth. So it's, it's led to a whole bunch of interesting questions. There's another type of animal that looks radially symmetrical, but it's not, and that is the echinoderm. So the echinoderms are things like sea stars. So when you look at them, you're like, oh, yeah, you know, you have a whole bunch of different ways that we can make them symmetrical. And it turns out this is false. So these are not symmetrical. A lot of people will call them symmetrical, radially symmetrical. And by radially symmetrical, what we mean is you can split them up a whole bunch of different ways. Turns out they don't follow that pattern at all, even though they look like they do. Amongst the cnidarians, there's several categories, like we have the scyphozoa, which are the actual the jellies themselves, or the medusa form. Anthozoans are primarily what we would call polyps. Hydrozoa seem to be a combination of the two. And then we have the cubum. Cubozoa, and these are the box jellies, and these are all super, super toxic. From here, what we start worrying about when we classify the animals is whether or not they happen to have a gastrovascular cavity, or if they actually have a body cavity. A coelom turns out to be a body cavity. And I don't know why did that with an E at the end because it's not correct. There we go. 
So a coelom is a body cavity, and there's a proper body cavity, and there's a fake one. And it turns out we classify everything based on do you have a body cavity or not. So gastrovascular cavities are one way in and one way out. So these would be things like cnidarians and flatworms, <clears throat> because if you have a sea jelly, you know, there's one way in and one way out. So that seems easy enough. Flatworms are kind of gross. Uh, well, some of them are. So like you could have nudibranchs or sea slugs, which are examples of them. Uh, there's lots of parasites that are flatworms, like tapeworms and things like that, or blood flukes. The pseudocelomates are ones that seem to have a body cavity, but it turns out not to be a real one. That's what we call over here where it says pseudocelomate. So these don't happen to be a real body cavity. These are going to be roundworms. So roundworms meaning things like nematodes. And these cause all sorts of trouble with them. The acelomates, meaning gastrovascular cavities, and the acelomates, both of them turn out to have no real circulation, meaning they don't need to have a circulatory system because they're so tiny that they don't need it. It's when we start getting into real body cavities, so coelomates, that we need to have circulation. This here is Trochina spiralis. Uh, this is the reason why you have to cook your pork. So amongst the coelomates, or the eucelomates, meaning true coelomes or the true body cavities, the first group is what we call protostomes, which literally means the mouth is first. And this has to do with how the body cavity is formed and the gastrovascular tract is formed. So this here, we're calling it the digestive tube. This is the GI tract or, you know, the intestinal tract or something like that. So it turns out the first hole that forms turns out to be the mouth and we call those protostomes. So those are things like annelids. So these are segmented worms. So think of earthworms and leeches. Mollusks are things that happen to have um, mantles and they have shells. So think of squid and octopus and how you think of snails, things like that. Arthropods turn out to be polyphyletic, meaning it's a whole bunch of different things that we're clumping together, so they're not really all related. But we can call them things like crustaceans. Crustaceans have ten legs. You can have insects. These turn out to have six legs. You can have the arachnids. Arachnids turn out to have eight legs. You could have other weird things like horseshoe crabs. which are not crustaceans at all. You could also have the millipedes, which don't have a thousand legs, and the centipedes, which don't also turn out to have a hundred legs, but we call them that anyway. So we have all of these different organisms. So these turn out to be examples of uh, protostomes. So praying mantis, snail... Here's an annelid. This is actually something called a rotifer. We don't talk about those. We're going to ignore these two. The deuterostomes are the ones that form the mouth second, meaning the anus is produced first. The echinoderms, who we've met before, turn out to be deuterostomes. These are the ones that act, or they look like they're radially symmetrical, but they turn out not to be. So like if you were to look at a sea star, they actually have a structure called a madreporite. And it turns out if you could find the madreporite, you can look to the arm opposite of it, and this is the head or the leading arm, so you could actually identify how you're actually supposed to make it symmetrical or bilaterally symmetrical. The other of the deuterostomes are the chordates. Chordates we'll talk about in a moment. They're uh, rather unique because there's only two real groups of deuterostomes. There's lots of protostomes, but there's only two extant, meaning still alive, groups of deuterostomes, which, of course, like I said, are the echinoderms and then us, the chordates. And it turns out 
we kind of retell the story of being Deuterostomes when we develop, which again is that phrase, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. So if I look at the diversity of the echinoderms, you have things like feather stars and sea lilies, but then you also have sea stars themselves and brittle stars, you have sea urchins and you have sea cucumbers. So we have all sorts of different types of these. And you've probably seen a whole bunches of those. The chordates turn out to have a unique set of characteristics, and we turn out to have all of these characteristics. This figure here shows them. They have this thing that we call a notochord. For us, it it's converted into part of our intervertebral discs. A post-anal tail. We actually do have post-anal tails. You learned in lab about the coccyx, which are the tail bones. We all have pharyngeal gill slits. Ours don't fully develop. They actually start, and then they start they get shuffled around, they form our lower jaw, and they form our inner ear. We also have a hollow dorsal nerve cord, and if you were to look at a spinal cord, it does happen to have a hole in the middle of it. So there's the hollow part. And it's dorsal because it's on our back. If you were an insect, it'd actually turn out to be in the front of your body. Most of these chordates are vertebrates. There are invertebrate versions of it, like this thing here is something called a lancelet or amphioxus. There's five groups of vertebrate chordates, and they're the animals that you usually like to think of. And among those five groups of vertebrates are mammals. We are among the mammals, so we are chordates. Here's how you could put everything of the... So these are all the deuterostomes. If you were to try and put them all together. But if we were to look at the diversity of the chordates, we could see that we happen to have these things here. So the lancelets and the tunicates, those are invertebrates. We have several types of fish, which are all of these. So hagfish and lamprey eels, and then we have the sharks and the rays. We have then we have ray fin fish. So we have bony types of fish. Here you see uh, several types of bony fish. We then get amphibians, we get the reptiles, amongst those reptiles are birds that we recognize as kind of like a little offshoot, but birds are a form of reptile, and then we have us, the mammals. Amongst those mammals, we have things that we call primates. Amongst those primates, we can have what we call the simians, so we can have the tailed monkeys. Some of them are old world, some of them are new world. The old world monkeys don't turn out to have a prehensile tail, meaning they can wing it around, whereas the new world monkeys do. We then get into things that we call gibbons. We could also have the gorillas. We could have chimpanzees. We could have the pygmy chimpanzees or the bonobos. We have the orangutans. It's not an orangutan. And then, of course, missing from this picture would be the photographer, which would be humans who turn out to be also among the great apes. That's the end. We'll be doing a review in class on Tuesday. Um, it's also the last chance to make up quizzes. So if you need to, please do so.